Today we're in part four of the series we've had the last few weeks. This uh, series is called Broken, Good News for Troubled Times. And uh, I'm not going to go back over everything we've done before, but I do want to go back to what we concluded with last time. We've been in Romans beginning with chapter 7, chapter 8. We're going through uh, chapter 14, actually. And um, so we were in chapter 8 last time, and we concluded with Romans 8, 31 through 39. I'd like us to start with our focus there. Paul writes, What then shall we say in response to these things, all the things that God has done, all the things that they can trust him for? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God is for us. He asks again, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, last week we were talking about where Paul talked about the Holy Spirit groans and with groaning that we cannot even understand, not, not with words, and intercedes for us in that way when we even don't know what to say and what to pray for. Now he uh, says, and Christ is doing the same thing. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am convinced, he concludes here, that neither life, I'm sorry, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And after Paul assures us that nothing can separate us and separate God's people from God's love in Romans 8 that we just read, in chapter 9, he comes to the sad state of his own people, the people of Israel. They had everything going for them, and yet they rejected their own Messiah, Jesus. What went wrong? And what does God intend to do about it? For the next three weeks, we're going to be in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And in these three chapters, as we call them, they're all just a major segment of Paul's letter to the Romans. Paul goes back now and talks about the very people of God, the basis of everything, beginning with Abraham. The people that God chose, the God called out, they were his people. He rescued from Egypt. He rescued them and, and, and forgave again and again and again and again, all as part of the promise that through Abraham, all the nations and people of the world will be blessed. And that blessing came through the coming of his son, Jesus, the Messiah. And they missed out. They had everything. And as Paul's writing here, the Gentiles are in, and the very people of God are on the outside looking in, for the most part, and not even liking what they see. As we read last time in Second Corinthians 11, where Paul talked about even the Jews sentenced him to whippings, 40 lashes would kill, and they had 39, five times. So these next three is kind of a mini-series in the mini-series that we're in now. And I guess we would call it faithful in the face of failure, talking about God's faithfulness is what we'll be looking at. The title of today's message is called God's All-Inclusive Grace. 
And so we're going to be going through Romans chapter 9 and discussing Paul's discussion, or we'll be reading Paul's discussion on how one becomes part of the chosen people of God. Because those who were considered the chosen people of God, for the most part, no longer were. But to begin, let's, uh, I want to give you just a little background. Uh, this is from the um, Bible background commentary, uh, and it's part of the introduction to the book of Romans. And here, the situation of Rome, the Roman church is explained and why Paul is writing this letter. I think it's important for us to get that overview uh, because then we'll see as we go through this how uh, Israel's story fits into the overall context and what it means for us as well. Here they write, um, although Jesus' uh, Jesus's movement in Rome started among Jewish believers back in the day of Pentecost, as we read in Acts 2.10, most of the believers in Rome by the time Paul writes were probably Gentiles, possibly because many of the Jewish Christian leaders had been temporarily expelled for half a decade. Sometime in the 40s AD, probably AD 49 or so, the emperor Claudius expelled some or more, uh, much of the Jewish community from Rome apparently over debates about the Christ. The Roman church was thus composed largely of Gentiles until Claudius' death in AD 54 when his edict was automatically repealed and a number of Jewish Christians returned to Rome. Jewish and Gentile Christians, as well as Gentiles influenced by Jews and lax Jews less observant of the law, had different cultural ways of expressing their faith in Jesus. We'll read about that more in chapter 14 when we get up to it. Paul thus uses the gospel to address, among other matters, a church experiencing tension between two valid cultural expressions of the Christian faith. And while we look at what he has to say there, we can think, sit back and think about our own country and the tensions that are present now as well. And... Uh, Maybe we can learn some lessons as we go along, as Paul talks to this church, representing the mind of Christ, which we are called to represent in our communities, and how to have an impact, not only within the body of Christ, but outside as well. So we go into chapter 9. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll be in chapter 9 primarily uh, throughout the, the message. And... Um, uh, we begin with uh, verses 1 through 5. I'll be using the New Inter International Version. Paul expresses his concern here. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people those of my own race. That's saying a lot when you're saying, I would be willing to give my life for them all if that would make the difference. That's what Jesus has done. And so I think we can sense as he comes to know Jesus more and more intimately, that same mindset begins to be expressed as well. He is ministering to churches primarily non-Jewish uh, believers throughout uh, the Middle, uh, Middle East. And in his heart of hearts, he still aches for his own people. We can understand that. You can understand that. I certainly can, having lived overseas and listened to the news on the American Forces Network every morning and what's going on at home. He really, he ached the people of Israel. The people, verse four, uh, uh, theirs is the adoption to sonship. In other words, they had everything. The adoption to sonship. They were brought into, chosen to be part of that family, part of Abraham. There's the divine glory. Even going through the wilderness with the glory of God going before them in a cloud during the day and during a pill of fire during the night. The covenants, making them the special people of God. 
the receiving of the law that expressed in human terms how God thinks and how he wants people to live so that they can be blessed. The temple worship and the promises. There's are the patriarchs. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah who is God over all forever praise. Amen. This is what they're missing, he's saying. And he aches for his own people. Something we can ask ourselves as we go through this. What about our people? What about whether family, neighbors, local, local city, our country? What do we feel? Do we feel what God feels when he looks down on us? Knowing that, as Scripture says, he does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance, to a change of heart and mind toward him where they can come into a relationship and be blessed as never before. So we're going to look at a few lessons of Romans chapter 9. What does it take, if I can use that term, probably not the right way to ask the question, to become part one of the chosen people of God? What is necessary? What must you do or I do or anyone else do? Let's go further in Romans chapter 9 to see what determines whether or not one belongs to the Christian, to the chosen people of God. Uh, beginning in verse 6, Paul goes on. It is not as though God, God's word had failed, for not all who are descendants from Israel are Israel. So he begins to break it down now a little bit. Just because you are uh, a descendant of Israel, of Jacob, that doesn't mean necessarily that you belong to the Israel of God. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, he quotes. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but is is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. So the first thing we see that physical descent alone does not determine whether or not someone has been chosen by God. Even though they were uh, children of Abraham, not all of them were chosen. Only those from Sarah. But then he goes on and says, so it's not by physical uh, descent, there's no master race. There's no one superior over someone else just because of who they are and where they were born and what family or what country or what nationality or whatever. Verse 10, not only that, he goes on, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. So Isaac was in that line. Isaac was chosen. Yet before the twins were born, Jacob and Esau, or had any, done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Flip over what's normally done in society. Just as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I hated. Come back to that in a second. What we see here is, it's not only a matter of physical descent, but even if you descend from the right uh, um, progenitors, it doesn't matter. No matter what you've done, it's not a matter of works. The decision was already made between Jacob and Esau before they were born. And Esau had not done anything wrong, and Jacob hadn't done anything right. As a matter of fact, if you read the story, it's a flip-flop. Esau was the good guy. Oh, no. 
I've been in Germany, I've been out of Germany for 29 years, but I still am in trouble. I'll use the word, and then by the look on your face, I'll know whether it was a German or an English word, okay? Esau was the good guy, and Jacob was a schmarotzer. Okay, that, that was English. Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> that was okay, good. Um, but God chose Jacob. Not because of anything they had done. So to be part of the chosen people of God is not a matter of uh, descent, ethnicity. And it's definitely not a matter of works one way or the other. And so Paul goes on to verse 14 and says, well, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will, oh, I'll go back. This thing about Esau, I hate it. You see that in, um, in, in Luke as well, talking about those who do not uh, hate father, mother, uh, children, and so on, uh, cannot be my disciples. They have what they call hyperbole, hyperbole quite a bit, the way they spoke back then. And so what that means in this case is love way less by comparison than God. Okay. So in this case, Jacob was the chosen one. Esau was put aside. Not hate in the way we use the term today. Now, let me get back on verse 14. What then shall we say? God Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. That's why we're talking about all-inclusive grace. Mercy of God. Here's an illustration that might make it clear, too. There was a story told about a mother who came to Napoleon on behalf of her son, who was about to be executed. The mother asked the ruler to issue a pardon, but Napoleon pointed out that it was the man's second offense, and justice demanded death. I don't ask for justice, the woman replied. I plead for mercy. The emperor objected, but your son doesn't deserve mercy. Sir, the mother replied, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. All, and mercy is all I ask. Her son was granted a pardon. Didn't deserve it, but mercy is all I ask. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have judgment on whom I will have judgment. God is the one who decides. And why he chooses depends on what he has in mind in the big picture. The example given here, um, well, well, he said it to Moses, first I will have mercy, whom I will have mercy. That was back when Moses was on the mountain and God looks down and the nation, the people of Israel had gone and made a golden calf. You remember the story just after the giving of the Ten Commandments? They made this golden calf. In other words, they're back making up their declaration of independence from God and going back the other way. And God says, well, I have mercy on whom I have mercy. I promise this to Abraham and to Isaac and to, and to, and to Israel. And, and I will carry my promise out. And he had mercy on them. Now he let them know in no uncertain terms that wasn't the right thing to do. On the other hand, we, verse 17, Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power into you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants and wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. That always sounded hard to me. You know, why does God hard? What, what could Pharaoh do about it if God hardened, hardened his heart? But you read the story. And God didn't have to do much hardening because Pharaoh already had his mind made up, right? 
They were slaves. They'd been slaves for 400 years. They're going to stay that. And as a matter of fact, there's so many of them. That's our major workforce, and we like cheap labor. And so we aren't going to raise their minimum wage, and we're not going to let them go. No, that's wrong. He didn't. That wasn't in there. We're not going to let them go and worship your God. And Moses goes back, says, now, now, um, if you don't let us go, our God said that we're got, all the water is going to turn to blood. He hardened, he hardened his heart and said, no. As a matter of fact, I think that you guys have too much time on your hands to even be thinking about this nonsense. Therefore, get out there, you uh, foreman, and so on, and make sure that they cut back. they got to get their own straw to make the bricks, but we want the same amount of bricks in the same amount of time. He doubled down. That's the term we use today, right? Pharaoh doubled down. And he did it again and again. And he said, oh, stop. Get rid of the frogs. Well, I, uncle, I give up. But then afterwards, as soon as everything was okay, he doubled down again. No, you can't go. When God hardened his heart, what he did was he, did, he held back from softening it. He didn't grant him a change of mind. He didn't put a change in there to say, oh, this is, this is, God, look at all he's doing. Until it went so far that he couldn't take any more and he lost his own son. So what we see in all this is God is in charge. We call it sovereignty. God is the sovereign. God is in charge. God knows what is best. God knows what he has in mind. God knows that his whole desire is that no one should perish, but all should come to repentance. He wants good for everyone. God also knows that in order for love to be genuine, it's got to be voluntary. It's got to be free. And therefore, he will not force people to do what is the right thing to do. And so we come down to verse 19. One, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me th like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? God is the potter. We are the clay. He knows what the design is going to look like at the end. We're part of, of what he is doing. What if God, uh, although, choosing to show, uh, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, for with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. God did what he did in the way he did it so that those of us who have been called would be able to be called. And so therefore we come to ask the question, what was Israel's mistake? What did they do wrong? What can we do wrong to mess up the whole thing? We'll drop down to verse 30. What should we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, Jesus, who came and said, it's not by works. It's totally a gift. There's nothing that you have done or can do. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. 
And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Putting our faith and trust in Jesus. But you know, I'm talking to Americans now. And one beloved guest here, you know. <laughs> Although I know Canadians, not all of them, you know, not all of them, there's they're some, and they may be similar. I just know myself. I don't want to be a burden. If I can do it myself, I'm going to do it myself. And the best way to do it myself is if I do it my way. Matter of fact, I know a song that I could sing all about that. A guy named Frank did it. He's not around anymore. Um, and that's what, the, what Israel did. They had the law. They had the in information as to how to live. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. But it became the law. It became the rule. And when you're living by law and not by love, you're going to go astray because you cannot keep that law without breaking it. Now, since this is going to carry on next week and the week after, and you get to go home in the meantime and then come on back for the rest, um, I'm just going to conclude this by reading a summary by Eugene Peterson in the Message Study Bible that kind of gives the picture not only for today but going forward what, where we're going and, and what we need to take home with us. This is how he explains chapter 9 and then touches on 10 and 11 too. Paul's way of trying to understand what we call the doctrine of election is to reflect upon the historical record in the Old Testament of how God responded to unbelief. Romans 9 through 11 is the result of his reflections. Paul's first point is that God is sovereign. We just talked about. He is not a democratic leader. He doesn't get to be God by popular vote. He doesn't take a poll before making a policy decision. He doesn't depend on a consensus for his actions. He is, after all, God. Unless we forget, we are not. Paul uses the illustration of the power, potter and the clay to make his point. That puts things into perspective. God is in charge, and he can do what he wants. The second point Paul makes is that we are responsible. If we seem to be rejected, as Israel certainly seemed to be, it's our own fault. We have failed to believe. Paul reasons this way. Since God is absolutely sovereign, his most characteristic action is giving. His relationship with humans can't be maintained on any other basis. He can't owe us anything and so pay us back because he doesn't owe us anything. He owns everything. He can't need anything from us and so reward us for what we do for him. Since he's sovereign, he can only give. Grace is his characteristic attribute. But that means that all we can do is receive his gifts or, object the, or reject them. Faith is a receptive response to God's gift. Unbelief is a refusal of that gift and ultimately a refusal of the giver. The rejected Jews, Paul notes, had a great deal of religious zeal. They were neither lazy nor evil. They simply refused to receive. As long as they refused to do that, God rejected them. Rejection rests on something much more basic than good or bad conduct. It is a matter of willingness to receive gifts from God. Paul's third point is that rejection is temporary. God's rejection of Israel is temporary in order to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. It has opened the possibility of humanity's repentance, which paves the way to divine acceptance. That, this understood, rejection is merciful. 
if it weren't for this temporary rejection, there would have to be an eternal rejection, and that isn't the will of God. Does this mean that everyone will be saved? No. It means that none of us are rejected because we're bad, ignorant, poorly trained, or evil. Rejection is always a result of failure to accept God's gift. Only the person who refuses the gift is in a state of rejection. Paul has been dealing specifically with the Jews, but the theology he's developed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is applicable to everyone. Receiving grace is necessary not simply for our eternal salvation, but for all the everyday, every, everyday salvations we need here and now. All the daily deliverances we need from our battles with the world, the flesh, and the devil. God has given us the greatest gift of all in his son, Jesus Christ. And with Christ in our lives, through his spirit, working to transform our thinking, transform the way we live, transform how we see people, transform how we treat people. We are accepting and receiving that gift of love that goes on and on and on forever. And no one and nothing can separate us from that love as long as we're willing to receive it and give it. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you in your kindness and your goodness, your mercy, your, your greatness, but your wonderful grace. We thank you that we can know who you are. All made possible because you came to earth in your son, Jesus Christ, and showed us who you are and what you are all about and opened the way for us to have a relationship with you that will go on forever. And this is what we desire. That's why we were created right at the beginning. And that's what you are in the process of restoring through Jesus with the power of your spirit. And we get a chance to help out that everything will be made new and restored again. As we go forth from here today and for throughout this week, help us remember that we are called to join Jesus in spreading and sharing that marvelous love and grace that you have poured out upon us through your spirit to a world and to people around us that don't realize, don't know, but desperately need to experience your love and grace and goodness so that they may come to see who you are. And we pray, turn to you as well. Thank you in Jesus' name for your love. We pray this in his name. Amen.